Hello everybody, this is Tim here again, here with my review for Hellraiser Bloodline. Let's get this fucker in the focus. Just to start off, this film is only a passable two-star film. This is not a good movie, especially not a great movie, and it's sure and fuck no masterpiece. Uh, this movie is much weaker than Part 3, despite the fact that the story should be much more epic than Part 3. This movie is only fucking 85 minutes, whereas Part 3 was 98. This movie should be much longer than Part 3. This movie should be extremely long. Uh, or at least decently decently long. This movie should be like much more epic than what it is, is what I'm trying to say. It needs to be longer. This film feels really like cut and paste. It's like pretty much split up into three segments, past, present, and future. Uh, with a prologue and pretty much uh, <laughs> the... I mean, it just feels like, I mean, it's like, it starts out in the future, is what I'm saying, at the beginning of it, just like a little taste of what the future is going to be like for the ending of the film, for the third part, um, and the future part is the weakest part of the three, in my opinion, but the whole film feels like it's really extremely fast-tracked, like they just wanted to hurry up and get it over with, like they just wanted to get through everything extremely quick, I'll get into why it feels so fast-tracked. But the film is directed by fucking Alan Smithy, which right away is a fucking fake name that a direct director wants to use when he wants to disown a movie. So right then and there, this ain't a good sign at all. <laughs> uh, now where's our bloodline starring Bruce Ramsey? Bruce Ramsey, he plays uh, the toy maker in all three segments. Uh, he plays all three descendants of the bloodline. Uh, he's fine. Uh, Valentina Vargas and Doug Bradley as Pinhead. Doug Bradley is uh, fine as uh, is fine as Pinhead in the movie, although I don't like the way that they. I mean, I don't like the stuff they've got wrote for his character in this one. Some of the stuff Pinhead really does in this one kind of got on my nerves a lot. Kind of annoyed me in this one. I'll get into that. Let's just start off with the movie here. At the beginning of the movie, we got this toy maker. It's like 18th century France. This is the darkest segment of the film. Uh, and the coolest looking, I would say. I would like to see a Hellraiser film that takes place in uh, in this uh, in the 18th century, like in France, like pretty much like this. This I would like to have seen this segment stretched out into a whole movie. That would have been kind of cool. But um, we get 18th century France. It's the darkest segment of the three. You need this toy maker. He's fucking, you know, working on the puzzle box. He gets it finished. And uh, what I find funny is his wife's like. Uh, He's like showing it to her and it like uh, one of the pieces moves on its own and she's like, so what does it do? And she's like, oh, it doesn't actually do anything. And he's, I just thought that was funny. And he's like, I'll take it to people who appreciate my work. So it's like he's been, he's been paid to make it for this fucking uh, like magician who actually practices black magic. He's been paid to make it for him. The magician has like a fucking like apprentice named uh, Jocks. Or, or jock or sir how, how the fuck you pronounce it i don't know how you say it <laughs> but uh he has an apprentice working for him or an assistant whatever you prefer to say but uh so he's uh paid him money to make the puzzle box for him he takes it to him um so he th this is what this is what i mean by fast track and kind of weak twos this movie's supposed to be like the origin of uh, the puzzle box, like how it came to be and how it has the abilities to open the gates of hell. So basically what this ma uh, black magic magician guy does is fucking take the box, use it in a ritual to summon a demon uh, while he's saying some kind of chant, and then bam, boom, that's it. Then now the puzzle box can just open the gates to hell because he's, he was using it in a ritual where he said some kind of words that we couldn't even understand. So I'm like, that's it? Wow. That could have been done in like a fucking 30-minute segment, but whatever. This movie's not really about like the beginnings of the puzzle box. This movie is more about like this bloodline and uh I mean this the toy maker's bloodline and how it's cursed because they created the puzzle box that opens the gates of hell. It's more about that and their like battle with Pinhead and shit. It's more about that than it is like the creation of the puzzle box and like it doesn't really delve much more into the Hellraiser mythology than really any <laughs> to be honest for a movie that's supposed to be about like the creation of the puzzle box and stuff like that or has that kind of stuff in it uh it's this one feels like the least delved into the helpers <laughs> of mythology to me out of the first at the first four <laughs> but uh anyway so it's like they just went the fast track and you know bam boom now it opens the gate tail and like they kill this prostitute at the beginning of the movie the 
black magic magician guy does and his uh, his assistant or apprentice whatever and uh, they use like her skin for the demon to inhabit that they summon the demon's name is like uh, Angelique now this character of Angelique she's like a she's like a high ranking demon like pinhead I guess and uh, this character almost steals the show. She's like more fun and more interesting because we start the movie off with her. So we build with her like we go with her story wise more than we do with Pinhead. Um, and by this uh, this movie in the franchise, it's nice to see a fresh face. And it's cool to see, you know, like a, a different style demon character than Pinhead. Even though I like Pinhead better than this character because we spend more time with this character. And I don't like the way Pinhead's used in the film. She comes pretty close to stealing the entire film, to be honest. Um, but yeah, she comes really close to stealing the entire film. And I really enjoy watching her character in the film. So the the merchant, uh, John Merchant, has, you know, he's been watching what they did with the puzzle box and how they used it in the spell to summon the demon. And whoever summons the, whoever summons the the demon commands the demon or whoever summons the magic commands the magic or whatever that the black magic guy says something like that um so that'd be kind of interesting to me right there i would like to see somebody summon pinhead one time using the using the black magic and just have pinhead have to work with them that would be kind of funny to me uh but uh so he you know he obviously wants to know what the fuck should i do with this so somebody gives an idea of you created a box that you know summons demons create one or that can destroy him, or a device that can destroy him. So he wants to make some kind of device that can, like, trap, like, perpetual light, or, like, laser light, or something like that inside of it, and have that, like, e uh, just uh, fucking evaporate the, the demons, I guess, or... It's not really clear, I guess. It's just, like, the light is, like, going to be so powerful that it's just going to, like, rip them to pieces, or, or cut them to pieces, or something like that, because it's, like, really super powerful laser light, or perpetual light or artificial light or fucking something i don't know but um so he wants to do that he wants to kill him with light which is pretty interesting uh what uh what i mean is i i mean i just want to say that i don't think these films take full advantage of the mythology they have clive barker his interpretation of hell in part two was really interesting i would it just seems like these films are are almost like the mythology of these films are almost bigger than what some of the movies like story-wise are like if that's Clyde Barker's version of hell maybe it'd be pretty cool to see Clyde Barker's version of heaven but I don't know maybe that's taking it too too deep into the religious aspect it probably is but still you don't have to go over the top with it but I think it could be interesting it's just you know something give me something something you know deeper story-wise than what we're getting here and <laughs> at least in this movie this movie has a lot of good ideas in it, but it doesn't really use them at all. Like Angelique's character seems more like she's more interested in fucking the toy man or the toy maker than she is getting him to like, than she is uh, using him to to make a fucking permanent uh, gateway so they can stay there on Earth forever and open the gates of hell forever. So that's pretty much what they want the toy man to do. But she seems like she's got like the a hard on for him. It's like her methods are different than Pinhead's. Pinhead's like all about torture and shit like that, and she's more about uh, seducing him to try to get him to do what uh, they need him to do. But at the same time, she seems like more like she's lusting after him herself. So it doesn't really delve deep into that uh, enough for me. So I'm kind of left hanging on: Is she just wanting to fuck him? Is she really wanting uh, him to be with her, or or what? What the fuck is she, what the fuck is she wanting? I need deep more deeper writing here but anyway so one thing leads to another he decides to come there to steal the puzzle box he goes there the magician guy's dead jocks has uh, betrayed his master and now is like spending his uh, now commands angelique and he basically just commands her to be a sex slave and she just fucks him for i guess the rest of tw uh the rest of time until we get to the present segment but uh he goes there to steal the puzzle box he gets ready to steal it and the uh, the magician guy's like his body is like laying there, and you think you think he's uh, he's dead. Of course, you get a little jump scare before he is truly dead, and uh, that's like so predictable. And I'm like, okay, whatever. But uh, then uh, fucking Jock shows up and knocks the merchant out, and then uh, tells Angelique to kill him. Somehow he gets away from Angelique. Like I'm saying, it's just like really fast tracked. It's like you know, bam, boom. There, there's how the box came to be. There's how the box can open the gates of hell. 
uh, bam, boom, let's get to the present segment. So somehow he gets away from Angelique. We have we never we have no idea how. Yes, I am scratching an itch, <laughs> but we have no idea how the fuck he gets away. But he does somehow. He makes it to his wife, who's obviously pregnant with their child. He tells her to get the fuck out of Dodge. He dies from his wounds. We skip to the present segment. Um, the present segment takes place directly after, well, I don't know about directly after, but it takes place after the third film and explains that the building that was built that uh, is, in, is like was built by the, the present version of the toy maker. And that he built it like inspired from his uh, his dreams that he's been having about the box and all that and shit like that. Um, and he's been having dreams of Angelique like uh, he's been having like nightmares over where she's like eating his heart. So that's kind that's kind of decent. That's kind of decent right there. Though that scene's kind of decent where she's like fucking. She's like she's uh he's having a nightmare over and she's like I know what's in your heart, John Merchant. <laughs> she's like eating his heart. Uh, like I say, she steals most of the movie from Pinhead, <laughs> but um. Uh, so he's having nightmares of her, but at the same time he's having dreams about fucking her. So <laughs> that's what I'm saying. It's like she's she's trying. I know she's trying to seduce him to get him to do what she wants, but at the same time she does feel like she's got the hot. It does seem like she's got the hots for him. It really does. And they don't really delve deep into that enough. Uh, why? I, I don't know. I guess they just wanted to fast track the movie. It's kind of. It just feels to me like again. It's like studios like horror fans are stupid, man. Fast track the movie. They don't give a fuck about all this shit that actually matters to the story. Just get it to where Pinhead shows up or get it to where someone's going to die. And that's pretty much what it feels like to me. But, uh, so uh, the present segment takes place after the, uh, the ending of Hellraiser 3. You got the Puzzle Box inspired building. Uh, the present version of the Toy Maker is still working on, like, the. He's still trying to make, like, the, the, the light box to trap perpetual light. I forgot what the actual name of uh, this configuration is called. I know the puzzle box is like the Lamont configuration. It might be like, I don't know what the fuck the other this one is called. Uh, the one that traps light. I have no fucking idea. I, I probably didn't pay attention. I probably zoned out because this movie is, this movie has like a really like television quality look to it. It doesn't look that good compared to the previous three. Uh, like every now and then it looks decent and pretty good looking. But most, of, but uh, I mean, well, most of the time it looks decent. I would say not pretty good, but decent. And then every now and then it like switches into like TV quality mode for some reason, like the lighting and the just the look of the film does for some reason. I don't know why it does that, but what the fuck ever. But uh, so he's still trying to make the box that traps the perpetual light and uh, Angelique summons Pinhead. We get like he tried. They try to give Pinhead like a pimp entrance where a chain just shoots out and like. Hits this guy in the throat and drags him into the to hell, I guess. And so Pinhead is there, and he has like this kind of really kind of cool character, like a Chatter Beast. It's like a Chatter, a dog version of Chatter. It's pretty cool. I guess it's like a low level creature, not not a Cenobite technically, but more like just like a like a kind of like the wall crawler thing from the first movie, I guess. Like a creature, well, not like that kind of creature, but just like you know a creature that just kind of like works with the Cenobites, I guess, something like that. But, uh, so he's got that with him, the Chatter Beast. The Chatter Beast is cool, but the special effect for it most of the time looks kind of weak, and he looks just like a fucking animatronic or a puppet or something. He just doesn't, he just doesn't look that good most of the time. Um, but every now and then he looks, he looks decent or okay. But, uh, so you got Pinhead and the Chatter Beast, and Pinhead doesn't like Angel. This is kind of neat. I like this. He doesn't like Angelique's, like, methods of her, like, seducing uh, the merchant to like uh, getting him to do what they need him to do. He's like growing tired of her methods and shit, and he just wants to force the the toy maker to do it. But he wants to like fucking do it by like kidnapping the toy maker's son and like forcing him to do it like that. And that kind of makes Pinhead once again into more of a generic villain. And you even get a scene where Pinhead's like stroking a pigeon. It reminds me of like a fucking like Doctor Evil from Lost in Powers, like petting on his cat or something like that. Just all scenes like that, and Pinhead like fucking. Still in the, like, I mean, like kidnapping the toy maker's son just makes him feel too much like a, just like a generic standard villain. Not really much to him. I've been talking about how I feel like the first two films are the completion of Pinhead's character arc. Uh, I really feel like that because the first two films are what I feel is the true version of Pinhead, in my opinion. And that that version of like Pinhead's character like changes pretty much from movie to movie to movie to movie. 
in part one and two, he's kind of like who he's supposed to be, like an explorer of flesh and shit, and that's the way I prefer Pinhead, and to me, that's his true character art finished. And in three and four, he switches to, like, world domination Pinhead. One thing I find funny also is in part three, he was, like, unbound by Hell's Law, and he wanted to destroy the puzzle box, uh, so he didn't have to go back to Hell. But in the, this movie, he's, like, now working with Hell again, but he received no punishment from Hell. Uh... <laughs> For what he did, despite the fact that he wanted to destroy the gateway to hell and just act on his own and take over on his own. So I'm like, he received no punishment. Uh, I can just picture Pinhead like talking to Leviathan going, well, you know, it's just one of those days, you know. Uh. <laughs> I'm like, okay, what the fuck? Because uh, Angelique gets punished in the movie for not working, like, with, with tr for trying to kill Pinhead. She gets demoted to, instead of working with him, working for him to, like, being his grunt or one of his soldiers or members of his team instead of like an equal or whatever. But um, Pinhead receives no punishment at all. And he seems to still have the powers he had from part three despite the fact that he should be back in more of a soldier ranking order instead of like a leader like he was in the third film. Like in, com in complete control like he was in the third film. He can still create Cenobites like he could in the third film despite the fact he didn't have that power in the first two. So it's like, I know they probably just threw that in there because they probably didn't even bother to pay attention to the story of the third one. They probably just like, well, he created Cenobites in that one. I guess he can still do it. What the fuck ever. But I know that. But, you know, still, like, that shit still irks me. But anyway, so Pinhead wants to kidnap his son. You get, like I said, they don't, it's like they don't know what to do with this film. Like how to explore the mythology that they're trying to explore in this one. It's like they just put in this, they put in a scene with these two security guards that Pinhead randomly turns into Cenobites into like these two twins, like twin Cenobites that are like connected by their fucking heads and stuff and their shoulders. That's, I mean, it's a neat scene, but I mean, it just feels like it's there for padding. It just feels like it's there just to, you know, make the movie longer. Like they didn't know what the fuck to do. So Pinhead kid, kidnaps, um, kidnaps the toy maker's son, uh, uh, he manages to get his son back. He tells his son to get the fuck out of Dodge. Um, and this is another weird scene. Angelique is like, uh, Pinhead's coming, and she's like, use the toy maker's design. And like, telling him to turn on, like, the lights or whatever, wanting him to kill Pinhead, I guess. And the lights are coming on and trying to hit Pinhead, but the machine's not ready yet, so the lights uh, don't stay on long enough to kill Pinhead, so he's still alive and it doesn't work. And so he decapitates the, the merchant because of that. And I'm like, why the fuck would you decapitate the merchant? You need the merchant to make a permanent gateway so you can, you know, stay on Earth forever and not have to go back to hell. And then you kill him. It's like, that's completely defeats the purpose of what you're trying to do. It just makes you look like a fucking idiot, Pinhead. But anyway, that's a gripe. And why does she try to kill Pinhead? It's like she doesn't like Pinhead or something? What? I I don't, it doesn't, like, I, I, I know, like, I have looked up, I've seen this movie before, and I've looked up stuff about it back in, you know, before I've done this review, like, years ago, and I know that there, this movie was going to be directed by Kevin Yeager and had a lot more to it, and was a lot more developed, and it was watered down over and over and over and more and more and more, and just more watered down until we got this shit, shit pile here, but, um, I know that she actually wants to kill Pinhead, because she, like, thinks he's out and doesn't like him, she disagrees with his methods, I guess, and thinks he's dangerous, and just, um, and I know that the movie was longer, and it took longer to get to Pinhead, and they had to, wanted to rush it up and condense it down so they could get to Pinhead quicker, um, basically this studio buttfucked this movie and buttfucked Kevin Yeager, and Kevin Yeager said he'd go to hell, which I don't blame him, he got the fuck out of Dodge, and then Alan Smithy gets credit, <laughs> which is funny. There was even a character of a neighbor who was at who was killed by Pinhead and but promised to give Pinhead a better fight in the future and actually came back reincarnated in the future segment and fucking like duped it out with Pinhead. That would have been kind of neat, really, but um, we don't get that either. So it's like, you know, bleh. this movie feels the most butt fucked by the studio uh, out of every one I've seen thus far in the first four. Um, but um. So he kills the merchant, and then fucking uh, the 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 merchant's wife in the present segment, she figures out like in two seconds how to work the puzzle box, 
and use it against the Cinnabites to send them back to hell. She sends Chatterbeast to hell, then she uses it on Pinhead. And like the, it, it tries to be like an overly epic scene, and like the whole fucking like room explodes as Pinhead's getting sucked back to hell. So the merchant's son and his wife both both survive, and of course the boy like you know carries on the bloodline. Um, one other thing. <laughs> This is one thing though I do like about this movie. Is this the last film in the franchise to have continuity, like direct continuity with the first the uh, three? It's the last movie to feel like a real sequel. The rest of the movies are part of the franchise after this one, but they're all standalone stories. I think the rest of the movies after this one all take place after the present segment of Bloodline. Uh, so, but they're all standalone stories. They don't directly connect with this one, which they couldn't really directly connect with this one anyway i mean you can't make a sequel after the ending of bloodline you can't nobody i don't think anyone wants to see hellraiser on an alien planet like killing aliens or something or in 2056 or whatever the fuck <laughs> one other thing is pinhead like not only is he like a gen such a generic villain in this one more than the first more than the third one uh he fucking monologues way too much like pinhead has like such a massive ego and he fucking blabs on and on and on and on. And he blabs, like, with his back turned, just talking nonstop. Like, he has such an ego that he's just talking, like, with his back turned directly to the person that could potentially beat him and kill him. <laughs> and, he, and, he, and he turns around, the person's gone. He's like, what, huh? <laughs> it's like, what the fuck did you think? He's too busy talking. Like, he could kill the toy maker in, like, two fucking seconds, but he's too busy talking him to death. I just find that hilarious and so aggravating at the same time that he just monologues fucking constantly. When we get to the future segment, we got Bruce Ramsey again, um, fucking playing the the final descendant of the Toy Maker, I guess, at least in the Bloodline story. Uh, he's made like uh, he's finally perfected the the design of the the box that's gonna trap the light. And, uh, there's, like, uh, he's, he's, like, created this space station in space that he's gonna, it's gonna, like, fucking transform into the actual box and blow up with the light inside of it and kill the demons inside of it. You get a really shitty CGI, like, version of the box with this fucking robot's, like, trying to open it. And then the robot blows up, which is an okay scene with the robot blowing up, but the CGI box looks like fucking dog shit. Um, and then there's, like, these fucking, like, marines who show up there and, uh, they're wondering, you know, what the fuck's going on? Why did you send everybody, you know, out of the away from the space station that you've made back to Earth? Why'd you send them all back to Earth? What the fuck's wrong with you? <laughs> and they keep him in this little prison. It's like a really shitty, like, <coughs> like those laser lights that are keeping him in there just look like, you know, regular light, just like shining through a hole or something. It's like, like they couldn't afford an effect for a laser light. It's so fucking stupid looking to me, and just like just cheap looking, just sorry looking to me is what it is. But you got that. I fucking hate that. So, uh, but another thing I find funny is that the Cenobites are fucking just trapped in a room. They're trapped in a room with like a titanium door, I guess, or steel door, or solid steel door, and they can't get out of the room. They just can't get out. There's no way for them to get out. They can't get out. They can't get through a door. I just find that funny. This guy's like, Pinhead's like fucking like the main man in hell, and he fucking, he can't get through a door. The Cenobites can't get through a door. I just find that hilarious. It would make much more sense if the if the merchant had like a fucking you know spell protection and shit like that, you know, to keep the Cenobites in that room. But instead, what, how does he keep them in there? He just he just closes the door. <laughs> I'm like, okay, wow. But anyway, so that was fucking stupid. One thing leads to another. One of the soldiers lets him out. Um, he gets killed. His skin gets ripped off. He gets killed by a chain to the head. Uh, decent scene. But uh, for the third, I mean for the final segment here, the future segment, the film just turns into basically a slasher movie. Each one of the soldiers gets picked off one by one. It's just boring. It's just really boring. The soldier characters are all worthless. Um, fucking, um, this one gets killed by the two twin Cenobites who fucking like split apart and really shitty fucking horrible CGI. And like their two heads like, connect with him in the middle, like, grind him in the, like, a big puddle of blood or pus or whatever, and that's how he dies, and it's like, okay, um, fucking, um, this other guy, he gets killed by the Chatterbeast off screen, he shoots Pinhead with a laser, though, 
<laughs> I find it fucking funny that Pinhead can't be hurt by a laser, but um, he can be killed by. I mean, he can he can't get out of a room. He can't be hurt by a laser gun, but he can be fucking. He can't get out. He can't get out of a room. I just, I just find it hilarious. <laughs> but this one dude gets killed by the fucking Chatter Beast off screen, and the Chatter Beast gets killed by putting in a gets trapped in a room by this girl soldier. Uh, character's name's Rimmer, I believe. She traps him in a room and fucking hits, like, the pressure lock, and it just blows him up. <laughs> and I'm like, so he just gets blown up by air pressure, and I'm like, what? I guess where he's a lower-level creature and not really a Cenobite, he can just be killed by traditional means, I guess. But at the same time, I'm like, okay. But anyway, so Chatterbeast is dead. Uh, and you get Angelique again, and they've been constantly, fucking constantly, constantly building up, like, her relationship with the toy maker. And then finally here in the final segment, they don't even meet. They don't even meet. And now she's in just a regular Cenobite form. She's been demoted where she tried to fuck over Pinhead, and she's just in a regular Cenobite form. So they, they don't even have a meet. They don't even meet. Her and the toy maker don't in the final segment. You get a scene where she kills a soldier by, like, pulling his head through a fucking mirror. And, like, his, he gets decapitated by the glass, like, through the glass. Decent scene, but once again, it's just standard slasher movie shit. <laughs> I'll never forgive the movie for this. Pinhead is in there talking to Merchant. And he's just fucking, Pinhead's just babbling on and fucking on and fucking on. And while Merchant, he just turns around he's like, what? Merchant, know where to run, know where to hide. <laughs> I'm like, Pinhead, you stupid fuck. Obviously, he has a plan, and you're just blabbing and talking his ear off while he's getting away. You ignorant son of a bitch. But anyway, even though Pinhead's a fucking fucktard in this movie, another thing I find funny is like, fucking Pinhead's like talking to Merchant again. Merchant's asking what what does he believe in, and Pinhead's like, nothing. I'm so exquisitely empty. And he's like, well, it won't hurt you to die. And he's like, I cannot die, or something like that. Um, uh, and then fucking uh, he all at once the Merchant just disappears, and Pinhead's like, huh? What? 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 He just has a look on his face, like you know, what the fuck? <laughs> But it's like, it was a hologram, Pinhead. <laughs> I'm like, Pinhead don't even know what the fuck a hologram is. But uh, I just find that funny. <laughs> but anyway, so, of course, Pinhead's been outsmarted. And the toy maker, the toy maker and fucking Rimmer are already on an escape pod. And, Pin and fucking Rimmer, I mean not Rimmer, but the fucking toy maker hits a button on a control and causes the fucking space station to start transforming into the, the cube that holds perpetual light. And uh, fucking Pinhead gets blasted back from the, the explosion of the uh, place fucking blowing up and transforming. So it's like the force of the explosion is kicking his ass and destroying him. And I'm like, so what the fuck the point of the light? Why don't you just trap him in a fucking space station and just blow him up? Why don't you just do that and just leave and just blow it up by remote? But whatever. <laughs> so he's getting blown up. He get a cool scene though where like half his, part of his face is like off and... Uh, of course, the you get a uh, cool line here. The merchant's like end game demon, and Pinhead's like oh man, and he fucking like the whole place blows up with Pinhead inside of it. It's really cool, and I like the effect of the space station turned into a cube. And then you just get a shot of their escape pod flying towards Earth, and they're safe. And then bam, cut credits in the movie. And I'm like, okay, wow, just 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 wow. This is the last movie chronologically chronologically taking place after you know the film before it. All the rest of the films after this one are pretty much standalones. Um, so this is how they end the continuity of the films that they've built up, or the continuity that they've built up so far. And I'm like, fuck me sideways, this sucks. This is only a passable two-star two film just for the fact that Angelique and Pinhead, uh, just the fact that Angelique is entertaining to watch and some of the scenes are entertaining to watch, and Pinhead is just mildly entertaining. Pinhead's like his own worst enemy here. I mean, he he is like his own worst enemy in this film, almost because he fucking just blabs nonstop and it just annoys the shit out of me. But as far as this film goes, it's only a passable two-star film. I got Hellraiser Inferno next. Hellraiser Inferno, in my opinion, is not a perfect film, but it is much better than this film. And I I'll get to that film uh, pretty soon. But uh, as far as it goes for this film, like I've said, it's only a passable two-star film. It's a weak film, and definitely the weakest of the four films I've seen so far. I don't hate the film. I'm just extremely fucking disappointed in it. This film could have been so much more. It could have been the best of, uh, or at least the second best, the third best of the films. At least as good as part two. It could have been. <laughs> but it shits all over its potential. It fucking shits all over it. Uh, just because it's so watered down. I'll see you guys again with Hellraiser Inferno. 
So, just final thoughts on this film. If you've watched the first three, I would still say watch this film. Just to finish off the continuity set up by the first three films. But, if you're just wanting to watch the good films in the franchise, I would, even though this is just, a, even though I give this film a passable two stars, just passable, uh, I would say skip this one. Regardless of the fact it's got a passable two stars, I would say skip it if you're only wanting to watch the good films in the franchise. Because this is not a good film at all. It's just a passable film. It's just kind of there in the franchise. It ends the story set up like a... Well, it ends the, well, it ends the continuity set up with the first film. But that's pretty much all it does. Other than that, this film is fucking weak as shit. So I'll see you guys again with Hellraiser Inferno. And I hope you have a good day.